Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. I, as always, am your host, Simon, and what happens here is Callum, the writer on this show, has delivered me a script, which I have in front of me right here. You could probably hear that. I'm going to read it. I've never read this before. You know this if you're a regular viewer or listener of this show. And speaking of that, you can either watch this show on YouTube or listen to it wherever you get your podcasts. And, uh... If you're watching on YouTube, remember to smash that like button. If you're listening as a podcast and you're not on Spotify, which most of you are, I looked at my analytics for the first time in a long time. And I'm like, wow, Spotify is taking off as a platform because that is the most listened to, this podcast is listened to the most on Spotify. Other than YouTube, of course, which I think is currently gets more downloads on YouTube than on podcasts. This is not interesting, unless you're me. You're here for true crime, and that's why today we have the Mary Morris murders. But, 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 this is going to be hard to read. Let's just crack on with it, shall we? Oh, by the way, my whole rant at the beginning. <laughs> but the whole point of that story that no one was interested in is like, leave me a review if you can. It actually helps get the show in front of more people. Or tell a friend. That's also welcome. I see you people on Twitter tagging me in your recommendations, saying the casual criminalist is amazing. I love it. Or, you know, people being like, I don't like the asides. <laughs> Which, honestly, with these ones, I can't blame you. But yeah, tell a friend. Every now and then a criminal case comes along that's truly stranger than fiction. Today we're exploring one such story, a compelling mystery from the turn of the millennium, equal parts outlandish and intriguing. We're going to be going through all of the facts and prevailing theories on how two normal women met horrific, unexplained ends. These are the Mary Morris murders, a duo of cases which gave investigators in Texas a bad case of deja vu. Two women with the exact same name turned up dead in similar fashion within days of each other. But were these two violent deaths a case of incredible coincidence, or was there something even more sinister going on? I don't know how many murders take place in Texas, like on a daily basis, or within a few days. Uh, that would help me get an idea of how uncommon murder is in Texas. And then also, I don't know how many Mary Morrises there are. Mary Morris seems like a fairly common name. Like, I think there would be a lot of Mary Morrises. Anyway. The death of Mary Lou Henderson Morris. In the early morning of October the 12th, 2000, Mary Lou Henderson Morris left her home in Baytown, Texas to drive to work. The 48-year-old was a loan officer at Chase Bank in Houston, about a 30-minute drive from her house. That day, the bank would have to go short-staffed. Somewhere between her office and home, Mary disappeared. Her co-workers started calling around, but nobody knew where she was. The last person who had seen her was her husband, Jay Morris, when she left the door at 6 a.m. Later that day, he would receive the worst news imaginable. Mary's Chevy Lumina had been found, burned out, and abandoned by the side of a remote road about three miles from their home in the wrong direction from Houston, and there was a body in the front seat. The remains were so badly burned that identification would take some time, ultimately relying on dental records, but it was safe to assume that it was Mary Morris. Her condition also made it impossible to determine a cause of death. Suffice to say, foul play was suspected, but even more puzzling was the motive. Was she, she was just a regular woman? A loan officer? I don't know what a loan officer is. Is that someone who gives you the loan or chases you up for a lo loan that you owe? I can't imagine, like, Mary Lou Henderson Morris who's 48 year, years old, is going to be some sort of like, what are they called? Debt collectors? Uh, bailiffs. Bailiffs is the word I'm looking for. She doesn't seem like this person. Mary had no enemies that anyone knew of, and robbery seems unlikely. There were pieces of jewelry melted onto the remains, meaning the killer wasn't bothered about taking them with them. The only things missing were her purse and wedding ring. Neither Jay Morris nor Mary's ex-husband seemed likely suspects as they were compliant from the outset, leaving the authorities stumped. Even if the people, the husband's compliant and stuff, that just means he's thought it through. Look, I've seen enough CSI. <laughs> I've watched enough true crime shows. No, let's uh, let's stick with the husband a little bit longer. But I get the feeling he's actually innocent today. But still, the death of Mary McGuinness Morris. Just four days after the death of Mary Morris, Mary Morris was found dead. No, that's not a copy-paste error, and Mary Lou Morris hadn't made a miraculous reappearance. This was an entirely different woman who happened to share the same first and last name. On top of that, the circumstances of the deaths were strikingly similar. The body of Mary No. 2, Mary McGuinness Morris, 39, was found just 25 miles away from the first crime scene. Okay, in the whole of Texas, that's extremely close together. That is really pushing this to be 
not a coincidence anymore. If it happens somewhere really far away on the other side of Texas, because Texas is absolutely massive. Like, look, Americans, I've seen that thing where they take Texas and they overlay it on the entire continent of Europe. You're like, oh my God, <laughs> Texas is big. America is really big. Just like the first, the victim was found in her car by the side of the road and her wedding, wedding ring was missing. Definitely not a coincidence. Uh, to the untrained eye, it might have looked like a suicide. Mary had died from a gunshot wound to the head using a weapon which her husband had recently lent her. But there's plenty to suggest otherwise. Mary's clothes were torn in pieces, bruises on her wrist suggested a struggle, and cloth fibers in her mouth showed she was likely gagged sometime before her death. Add to that the fact that the passenger side door was left open with keys outside the car, and it's little wonder the medical examiner determined that Mary was in fact murdered. To make that a stranger, it seemed that the victim may have had an inclination that her life was in danger in the lead up to her demise. Mary number two worked as a nurse, overseeing several clinics for a pharmaceutical company named Union Carbide in Houston. Is that the same Union Carbide? It must be the same Union Carbide. From, um... Uh, the Bhopal disaster was a Union Carbide plant. Recently, or maybe about a year ago, made a Geographics video, which is another channel I do, all about the uh, Bhopal disaster, which is horrific. And Union Carbide... <laughs> I don't know, allegedly, not, not, not that awesome, guys. Really, at all. Anyway, let's move on before I get into tricky legal water. She met with her friend Laurie Gemmel at one of those clinics on the 16th to give her an allergy shot. Not long after the two parted ways, Mary called Laurie from a drugstore, telling her that there was a man giving her the creeps. That was at about 5.30 p.m. The plan was to return to work to clock out, then head off home for dinner. But less than 15 minutes later, Mary made another phone call, this time to 911. Detective Wayne Kuhlman from the Harris County Sheriff's Department described the tape to the papers. We're not releasing the content of the tape. It covers the attack that happened to Mary, and anybody that's ever heard that tape has had their blood chilled listening to it. It's a very chilling, disturbing call. Her body was found several hours later. Wow, yeah, and that's one of those things. It's like, I'm curious what's on there. But I'm glad I, you know, I'm happy also not to know. It's like ISIS beheading videos. It's like, I know they exist. I, I mean, I'm not even curious about that. I don't even know. No, I just got no desire to see that. There's uh, there's horrible things on the internet. There's something called Run the Gauntlet, which I've heard of, like, vaguely. I think I heard some other podcasters talking about it, where it's just, like, progressively more horrible videos. And I'm like, I have absolutely no desire to watch that. Like, why would I? I know I'm just going to have those stuck in my mind forever. Like, why? Suspicious Circumstances so we have two Mary Morrises murdered in the same week, just a short distance apart. Surely that's too much of a coincidence, especially when the circumstances were so eerily similar. Was there a serial killer out there with a very, very specific victim profile, or was there some thread, as yet unfound, which linked the two women? Thankfully, the second case offered far more to chew on than the first, so we have some idea of what might have happened. The Coworker the first suspect was a fellow nurse at Mary's workplace named Dwayne Young. The two had a very poor relationship since they started working there, with Dwayne reportedly trying to smear Mary's reputation. This rivalry descended into outright hostility on the same day that the first Mary Morris died. That afternoon, Mary too discovered some things out of place in her office. Picture frames were turned over, among other things. Okay, so this Dwayne Young guy, if I, it seems like so he maybe knew that the first Mary Morris was murdered. If he's smart. He could be like, I know someone called Mary Morris, and if I murder her in the same way, they're definitely going to think it's connected to the first one and charge the guy who gets busted for the first one for this one as well. Where, I mean, but then he's, what if they don't, they don't count? Look, okay, working theory number one, honestly, not a very good theory. Let's carry on. I don't know what you guys are thinking if I'm, if I'm well off there. When she went to confront her office nemesis about it, it already left, but she caught a glimpse of something worrying scribbled on her desk calendar, the words, death to her. <laughs> that was actually the reason Mary borrowed the gun from her husband in the first place, worried that Dwayne might come get revenge for what happened the following day. After being reprimanded for his alleged harassment, he was escorted down to the building, screaming and shouting all the while. Some reports say he quit, some say that he was fired outright. Whatever the case, Mary was terrified that the threat on the calendar might be carried out, so she asked her husband to lend her the handgun. Wait, was this the same Mary who had the guy who was giving her the creeps? Yes, so she doesn't know him, so she would say if it was Dwayne, right? It's very confusing when they're both called the same thing, but this was the second Mary, so I guess it can't be Dwayne. Or can it be? Maybe he paid someone? That doesn't seem... Let's move on. The same gun remained tucked under her driver's seat for several days until it was ultimately used to end her life. Could the disgruntled ex-co-worker be the one who used it against her? 
the husband. Let's not all rush con to condemn Dwayne just yet, because there's another suspicious person to take a look into. Unlike Mary Number One's partner, Mary Number Two's husband, Mike, became a prime suspect in her killing from the outset. When interviewed by the police, he said that he was at the movies with his daughter, but he wouldn't let the cops speak to the little girl to confirm this. On top of that, Mike refused to take a polygraph test and lawyered up before being officially identified as the suspect. I have to say, like, if they were like take a polygraph test for something, polygraph tests are like basically pseudoscience. I don't know why they still use them. They're accurate like 51% of the time or something. So I'll be very nervous if I was innocent of a crime of like taking a polygraph test because I'd be like, wait, it's, it's going to get it wrong half the time. And you guys are going to get some crazy ass blinders on my guilt if I, if I fail a polygraph on something that I'm not actually guilty of because I'm nervous or whatever. Nervous that the polygraph's going to get it wrong because they get it wrong a lot of the time. None of this proves guilt, but his compliance also that he lawyered up before being officially identified. I'd be like, yo, my wife was murdered. The police are first going to come to me. I'm going to be calling a lawyer bloody quickly because I, if I'm guilty, for sure. If I'm innocent, for sure. Both times, both ways. You know it's happening. <laughs> I mean, assuming it's suspicious circumstances. Obviously, if someone's just murdered by light and it's plain as day who did it, obviously that's going to be different. Uh, his non-compliance definitely raises a few suspicions. It was also found that Mike and Mary had been having some marital issues. According to friends and family, he had followed her several times in the belief that she was having an affair and even confronted her about suspicions not long before. Is it possible that Mike ended his wife's life out of jealousy and tried to make it look like a suicide to more easily claim the hefty $700,000 life insurance payout? Um... I thought life insurance, it's, it's more likely to pay out if someone's murdered rather than they commit suicide, right? Because if you're committing suicide, it's like you're choosing to die and then you know there's going to be an insurance payout, which seems like a little more sketchy than someone getting murdered and then the insurance paying out, right? The icing on the cake of this theory is a four-minute phone call logged from Mike's cell phone to Mary's at 7.11 p.m. This was about an hour and a half after Mary called 911 to report her own kidnapping. Uh-oh. Was this Mike checking in for a status update from Mary's killer, or perhaps a final goodbye to the woman herself? Both are pretty chilling prospects, but all we can really do is speculate. Mike never really offered any real explanation for the call. He just said that it was a mistake on the part of the phone company, as he had only let the phone ring out for four minutes with no answer. If that was the case, then according to the company, it would have shown up on the records at all yeah that is a weak excuse <laughs> it's like yeah yeah it was a bank error phone company error it's probably not probably not an unlikely coincidence those might sound like some pretty tantalizing leads, but unfortunately, that's as far as the investigation into Mary Morris No. 2's death ever went. We'll leave it up to you to decide where the suspicion lies. Was Mike really just acting in his own best interests by keeping away from the investigation? And could the vengefulness of an ex-co-worker actually be to blame? But most importantly of all, how the hell does any of this relate to the poor bank employee found dead just a few days before? Well, the answer to that might lie in the missing wedding rings. This little detail has fueled speculation that Mary Morris's murders were part of the same calculated plot. Oh my. Do you think, another theory, that either the husband or this Dwayne chap, they hired a hitman to take care of Mary Morris, and the hitman got it wrong and killed the wrong Mary, phoned them up and was like, yo, 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 I'm ready for, like, my other half of the payments or however assassination works. And then they're like, oh no, what are you talking about? Mary's in the other room. And the killer's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, crap. Not this again. <laughs> and uh, then he has to go kill her again to get paid. Uh, uh, wild speculation. This little detail has fueled the missing wedding rings. Little detail has fueled speculation that the Mary Morris murders were both part, of the, both part of the same calculated plot. I say calculated plot when I really mean horrifically miscalculated blunder. See, in many cases, a missing wedding ring is a hallmark of a contract killing. Oh, Simon, you big brain. A token used to prove that the deed has been carried out. So the thread tying these two cases together may be one of the most unfortunate cases of mistaken identity ever. What I mean is if one of Mary Morris No. 2's enemies did in fact hire a hitman to enter life, then it's possible the killer just went ahead and killed the wrong damn Mary the first time. Despite the age gap, there are plenty of similarities between the two women, which could cause a case of mistaken identity, especially if the killer was a hired professional going only on a name and photo. Aside from the Mary Morris moniker, they also shared a similar permed haircut, white complexion, and city of residence. They were 25 miles apart, those two bodies? Yeah, they lived close. This theory is backed up by an anecdote from Mary Number no. 2's friend Laurie Gamble, who claims that a mysterious phone call was made to the Houston Chronicle on the 13th between the two killings. She's quoted as saying, 
A call came into the Houston Chronicle, and I verified this with somebody at the Chronicle, between the time the first Mary Morris was killed and the time my friend was killed, saying something to the effect that they got the wrong Mary Morris the first time. <laughs> this hasn't been verified, but if it's true, someone with knowledge of the crime might have been dropping a hint to the press the killer had made a massive error. Imagine the scene for a moment. Standing over the body of his victim, the hitman calls his employer to let them know that the job is done. Mary Morris is dead. The line goes silent for a moment as the husband turns around to look at his wife, sitting safe and sound on the sofa, very much alive. <laughs> Are you sure? Well, at least I have a funny story to share at all the contract killer conventions, Dark. Weighing up the odds. Now, I should warn you that before we finish, this is not the official account of events according to the police. Without any definitive evidence tied together to two crimes, they maintain that the whole thing is just a wild coincidence. Two unconnected crimes only linked together by freakish improbabilities. Guys, I mean, the odds of this are tiny. They're similar looking, they're both killed in the same way, they live very close to each other, and they're killed. If these occurred 10 years apart, people would be like, serial killer. These are linked, but they occurred within a few days. Police, again, what is up? Come on. Before you make up your mind either way, we've got a f either way, there's it's not a coincidence. <laughs> we've got a few last pieces of evidence for each of the main theories. Oh, if Callum's like introduces some other stuff now, which clearly makes it a coincidence, I'll be mildly embarrassed. Uh, first up, Mike Morris. If we return to the wedding ring for a second, there's a compelling anecdote which supports the idea that it may uh, have been returned to Mike Morris after his wife's death. Several months after, a family friend was visiting for dinner. They realized that Mike's daughter was wearing the deceased woman's wedding ring. When they asked Mike about it, he told them that Mary wasn't actually wearing it when she was killed, a fact which he forgot to tell the police about at the time. Was this evidence that he was in contact with the person who lifted the ring from Mary's body, or just a sad symptom of their marital problems? But perhaps one of the biggest problems of all with this story for me is, if you're planning on having a person killed by a hitman, why arm them with a handgun? Was he just trying to make the hitman really work for his paycheck? Yes, that is a curious detail. So maybe it wasn't the husband. Maybe it was this Dwayne dude. Yeah, it's... Look, I mean, it was Dwayne, right? It wasn't the husband. It, he wrote, like, she's gonna die or whatever on a computer screen. <laughs> and just, I know, Dwayne or whatever, it hasn't been, like, convicted, right? So all of this, definitely, allegedly, in my opinion, it seems this way. <laughs> So if not Mike, then what about Dwayne? We don't know exactly what information the police hold on this suspect, but it's been suggested that they know much more that they've th than they've thus far let on. The very, that very fact that Dwayne Young has never been officially ruled out suggests the absence of an alibi, which on top of his clear motive means we can't rule him out either. Why didn't they pursue this Dwayne guy more? Because at the end of the day, Mary's Mary number two's husband did act suspiciously, but maybe it's just to protect his own skin. Yes, he got a lawyer because his wife was suspiciously murdered. He didn't want to take a polygraph because polygraphs are flawed. The first, it, this is completely reasonable behavior. Dwayne, though, Dwayne, man, um, come on. If he were an unfortunate victim of circumstance, then he would surely understand how bad the situation looked for him, guilty or not, given the problems he and his wife had. Plenty of intelligent, innocent people have taken the advice of lawyers when they say that shutting up is often the best thing to do. Yeah, dude. Like, there's a, just, there's that brilliant video on YouTube. And I don't know, I don't, I've never, oh, I was contacted once by the police because I accidentally bought stolen goods. <laughs> and I got an email from a police officer. And they were like, hi, we're trying to contact Simon Whistler. Is this Simon Whistler? I was like, what is going on? Have I committed some crime? And this was, uh, it was like police in the UK. And I was like, I don't even live in the UK. And I'm like, what's going on? So I just reply like, uh, what's this about? And then they were like, they were very nice about it. They, I think they, they clearly knew that I'd not intentionally bought, I'd bought a, a, a drone off, off eBay, which some dude had stolen from a shop and sold. I had no idea. Uh, they were very nice and everything. I was like, okay, okay, this is, <laughs> I don't know why I was like, I've committed a crime. What, what crime have I unintentionally committed? But yeah, so they, uh, nothing ever happens of it in the end. I was not very impressed by that. I know, I feel like I rag on the police a lot in these casual criminalists, but also my personal experience with the police was also not very impressive because they were like, well, we'd like it back. And I'm like, well, I don't live in the UK. And unless you're going to pay for postage, I'm not going to post it to you because it's just an they're like the insurance company can claim it. And I'm like, well, great. So the insurance company can write to me. You've got my details, obviously. <laughs> um, so uh, have the insurance company just do this. And they're like, okay. And then I never heard from them again. Never. 
And so I still have this drone, which I didn't throw away because I was like, okay, maybe they, they're going to want it back. This was 10, no, not 10 years ago, five years ago, six years ago. So what is going on? What are we talking about? Why am I telling my own police stories? Oh yeah, because there's this brilliant YouTube video where it's like reasons you shouldn't talk to the police. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense. If I was arrested for anything <laughs> that I didn't do, or if I did do, I'd be like, I will shut the f*** up until I get a lawyer. <laughs> When the case started doing the rounds in the early days of the online true crime community, Dwayne apparently made a habit of defending himself in the forums. He maintained his innocence, claiming that he'd never made any threats against Mary's life. He instead threw suspicion back at the husband, as well as Laurie Gemmel, one of his most pub public accusers. Gemmel is quoted as saying, reference to Mary number two, She told me that she was afraid of this person that she worked with, and I said, Do you really think he could hurt you? And I said, Yes, I do and I think he could do worse. It seems that her problems with Dwayne Young went way further than a bit of Monday angst. If someone truly believes they're under that much threat from a person, I'm inclined to believe them. But aside from what maybe, maybe Dwayne will be in the comments being like, Hi Dwayne! <laughs> Allegedly. Freak coincidence. But aside from all that, if the first Mary Morris was the unfortunate casualty of a hit gone wrong, then we need to find an explanation for some of the strange circumstances which followed her death. About six months after her death, her husband, Jay Morris, received a whopping $2,000 phone bill addressed to his deceased wife. Detective traced Mary's phone card to a 16-year-old in Galveston about an hour from Houston. It's pretty unlikely that the killer was a high schooler, so how did she come across the card? The girl explained that she had found it in a purse that was left in a convenience store parking lot the month before. When the cops returned the purse to Mary's family, they were confused because it wasn't even hers. Not long after that, Jay started receiving strange phone calls from a mysterious caller asking for Mary. This happened three times, and the caller never identified themselves. They only stopped calling after he referred them on to the Harris County Sheriff's Office. The Hail Mary Long Shot there's one final theory which often gets floated around online, so we need to give it its due before finishing up. Some true crime fans have theorized that we have the whole thing backwards. Maybe the first Mary Morris was the intended victim, and the second murder was part of an elaborate pot to cover the trail. This is the my original theory, right? That someone sees Mary Morris was murdered, comes to the second Mary Morris, and now's, like, now's the perfect time to get rid of you. Because uh, they, they're going to link them. We may be stretching the bounds of probability here, but if we run with it for a second, it offers a bit of an explanation of one of the most mysterious parts of the case. Who called the Houston Chronicle? Now, I should state that the existence of that phone call is not confirmed, and it really might just be a load of nonsense. However, if someone really did call in to warn of the second killing to come, then what could the motive possibly have been? The killer would have hardly wanted to brag about his incompetence, so the only theory which makes any sense is that it was an intentional red herring to distract from the first killing itself. Again, I'm not convinced in the slightest by this, but when we're dealing with a case as strange as this, it's best not to rule anything out. So it's not even that. It was just as a distraction. No one's no one's going with my theory of it's the perfect time to off another Mary Morris. Just me. <laughs> Wrap up. Now you have all of the information behind one of the strangest mysteries in Texan history. Was this a double-barreled case of mistaken identity? Just a slapdash robbery and twisted revenge killing connected only by a bizarre circumstance? I think most of us are leaning towards option number one. As Jay Morris, the husband of Mary number one, put it, the astronomical odds that two Mary Morrises were killed three days apart, very similar in looks, to me, that's what it is. Astronomical odds that they're not connected. Part of the reason we're still talking about these cases over 20 years on is the fact that no one explanation perfectly wraps up all of the moving parts involved. No one angle ties everything together without leaving a few questions hanging. For that reason, it's likely we'll never have a full account of exactly why and how these women died. That is, unless there's a savant Sherlock out there that thinks they've cracked the case in the past 20 minutes. If so, there's a cash reward for any information that can shed some light on things. $5,000, as far as I can see. Happy sleuthing. So I won't go forward and collect that fight. Be it was a distraction to kill another woman called Mary Morris. The Whistler Theory. Dismembered appendices. Number one. The families of both victims spent years campaigning for new information in order to get some closure. Along the way, some minor silver linings have grown out of their tragedies. Marilyn Blalock, daughter to Mary Number 1, and Stephanie Lure, Mary Two's sister, became close friends after co-starring in an episode of The Montel Williams Show. What's The Montel Williams Show? I assume it's like reality TV, not like they went on to be TV celebrities. <laughs> Number 2. If the clumsy hitman angle seems too wild to be true, you should know there's already a precedent for this kind of thing. In 2000, it doesn't seem too wild to be true. Like, at all. 
In 2006, a higher resident, Daniel Ott, was killed with a shotgun. It took the cops eight years to conclude that this law-abiding citizen's only crime was sharing the same name with another Daniel Ott, who was set to testify against a chop shop garage owner and his stolen car operation. Best start praying that all your namesakes are on the straight and narrow. Yes, indeed. Fortunately, Simon Whistler is not that much of a common name. But, uh... Yeah, I well, I mean, I don't, I don't think any of my aliases are criminals. I hope not. <laughs> Please don't kill me. <laughs> oh, anyway, this has been an episode of the Casual Criminalist. I, as always, have been your host, Simon Fact Boy, as I'm also known on the internet. If you enjoyed it, as I said at the beginning, why not leave a review or a comment or a like, depending on how you are consuming this show. And as always, thank you for watching. I'll be back real soon. <laughs>